Thank you, Odane and Aaron. Well, can you believe it? As already has been said today, in a couple of days, it's going to be 2019. The time flies by, it really does, doesn't it? It goes by so fast. You know, you look back and you say, like, what happened to 2018? You know, but here we are, uh, a couple of days, and there's a brand new year. And what does New Year's always bring with it? New Year's resolutions. That's right, New Year's resolutions. Everybody has a lot of New Year's resolutions. You know, if you start to research and study a little bit about New Year's resolutions, I think something like 89% of New Year's resolutions typically fell. And, you know, we're, we're going to do this. It's going to be great, you know. And, and um, you know, I'm going to do this weight loss program or this fitness program or I'm going to make this amount of money or I'm going to get this promotion or I'm going to start that and start this. Let me tell you what my New Year's resolution is. I'm going to be completely open with you today. I want to pray with power more in 2019 than I did in 2018. I, I want God to take my prayer life to another level. Now, at Fellowship Pickering, we are a church where anybody can come and explore. And so you may be here today and you've been walking with Jesus Christ for a long time. And you pray on a regular basis or whatever that might look like for you. Or you may be here today as a first-time guest and, and you are just exploring Jesus. You're kind of kicking the tires of this thing we call Christianity. And you are wondering uh, about what this is all about. And so maybe prayer for you is something that is a little more foreign. But what we see in Scripture is that prayer actually changes lives. There is power in prayer. And when we look at prayer in Scripture, we, we see God's hand on people in a unique, specific way. And, and let me just say this kind of before we get started. R raise your hand this morning if you're ever tempted to sin. Raise your hand if you're ever tempted to sin. If you don't have your hand raised, you're what we call a liar in the dictionary. All right? We're all tempted to sin. We're all tempted to lust. We're all tempted to maybe steal or overeat or whatever it might be, right? Like, we, we were all tempted at some point or another. But Luke chapter 22, verse 40, says this. On reaching the place, Jesus said to them, pray that will you, not, you will not fall into temptation. So what we see here is that prayer is the catalyst that actually prevents us from sinning. How about anxiety? Does anybody have any anxiety in the room? I see a couple of you, you were like this when I said that, right? You were like, yes, me, I'm anxious today. Right? I'm going to be completely transparent with you this morning, okay? 100% going to keep it real with you. I've had a terrible morning. I mean terrible. You, you ever had any bad mornings before? And you just like, man, can I just get back in the bed? And, and man, I, I woke up and I spent some time with the Lord. I was kind of going over this message, you know, in my office, getting all prepped, you know. It was time to go to church, went out to start my car. <laughs> wouldn't start. I was like, oh, not today. Go back in. You know, I'm like, Erica, my wife, we have four children if you're a guest with us today. And uh, I'm like, we're going to have to all ride together. You know, they come in a little bit later than I do typically. And um, we got cookies in the oven because Erica's working in the kids' church today, and she had cookies in the oven, and then we had to batch, uh, bake another batch of cookies, and then, you know, the kids started doing what kids do. We have an 11, 10-year-old, 7-year-old, uh, and 3-year-old. I think that's their ages, and, um, and we lose track sometimes, and, and, you know, they're kind of arguing, and I want this, I want that, you know, typical kids stuff, and then I get this message on uh, Facebook from somebody asking a question about ministry in the States. I'm just like, Wow, my head's about to explode. Like, it was just a terrible, terrible morning. And I paused and I stopped. And I said, Lord, you're funny. Because I'm about to preach on prayer. And, and look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That, that passage of scripture has brought me so much comfort over the years. But listen, when we get anxious, when we have tough days... We can pray. We can pray with power. 
You ever feel like anyone is ever just out to get you? Like the whole world is out to get you? It's like you against the world. You go to work and like your coworkers are like, you, you, you literally think they're conspiring against you in the other cubicles or something. Like everybody's gossiping about you or whatever. Erica's got two little brothers and the youngest little brother, when he was a little boy, he used to go around. I don't know where he got this, but he used to walk around all the time and he would say this out loud. Nobody likes me. Everybody thinks I'm stupid. Nobody likes me. Everybody thinks I'm stupid. We're like, nobody's ever told you you're stupid. We all love you. We all like you. Like a little three-year-old, a little four-year-old walking around. Nobody likes me. Everybody thinks I'm stupid. It's like, you know, but sometimes you feel that way. You feel like nobody likes you and everybody thinks you're stupid. The Bible says this in the 118th Psalm, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Today, with our time we have left, I, I want us to talk about how in 2019, not, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, not even a full year, but how in 2019 we can develop a, a habitual process that will last us for the rest of our lives where we will pray with power. I don't, I'm not talking about this, Lord bless them prayers, or, or, or God is good, God is great, thank you for this food, amen prayers. I'm not talking about those kinds of prayers. I'm talking about praying with Power. I want to share with you four ways that we pray with power. And the first way is this, friends. We must prioritize prayer. We must make prayer a top priority in our lives. In a book in the Old Testament, it's actually the last book in the Old Testament, there is a prophet named Malachi. And that book is named after him. And he's writing to the nation of Israel to remind them to keep God first in all that they do. And the Bible says this. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? Notice the question mark. Isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. They were supposed to be giving God the very best of their animal sacrifices, the very best of their energies, the very best of the food, the very best of their time. But they weren't. As a matter of fact, they were giving God their leftovers. That They were giving God what was left over after they had given all the best. They'd taken all the good food. They'd taken all the good time. They'd taken all the good energy. And they're saying there's this little bit left over. I'm just going to kind of push it over here and try to serve it up to a holy, righteous, just God. Malachi says, oh, no, you don't. He says, God doesn't want your leftovers. You know what's so convicting about that passage? Is Malachi says, you wouldn't do that with your governor. You wouldn't do that with the people on earth that you really love. And so why do you think that you're going to get away with it with God? But we do, don't we? When it comes to prayer, when it comes to prioritizing prayer, we give God our leftovers. Man, man, I've got time to watch a four-hour football game. I've got time to go to Tim's and spend three hours with a friend catching up that I haven't talked to in years. I've got time to take coaching calls and conference calls, and I've got time to play with my kids, and I've got time to listen to my wife. But God help me, there are days where I can't spare 15 minutes to get with my God that saved me. That's sad, isn't it? And I wonder if I'm only in that boat by myself this morning. But see, we give God our leftovers, and then we ask him to bless it. Now, why is the question? Why do we think that that is okay? Because our priorities are out of order. Our priorities are out of order. You know, I love the holidays. I love Christmas. I love New Year's. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, you, you're probably trying to figure out, like, this guy talks a little funny. You know, we moved here from Memphis, Tennessee in 2012. We were raised in Oklahoma. And in the South, man, let me tell you something. We cook around Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's. And my wife, you know, she's a good old Arkansas gal. She's about to make black eyed peas and collard greens and cornbread and all those good things. There's going to be a ham bone in the middle of that. And it's going to be delicious in a couple of days, right? Good stuff. I, I love, though, not just the meal, but the leftovers afterwards. You know, they sit in that refrigerator, they start to marinate together, you know, and they, they do something magical. I think they dance at night together, and, and they start to, you know, the casserole, just, oh, it's so much better. The soups, the stews, it's so much better. Can I get a witness, anybody? It's so much better, right? We love those leftovers. I love those leftovers. You're, some of y'all think, I wish my kids would like the leftovers. But I love the leftovers. 
that, but you know who doesn't like our leftovers? God. God does not like our leftovers. The Bible says again and again and again, God wants our best. And you know what? Can I just say this today? God deserves our best. He deserves the first fruits of our labor. I had to learn this principle. My wife gave her life to Jesus before I did. And every month when we would get paid, Erica, we would sit down and we would balance out the checkbook and we would talk about our finances. And she'd, say, she'd write out that tie, that tie check and she'd put over here, this for the church. I said, now, wait a second. I don't know if we're going to be able to pay the rent or the mortgage this month. And you're going you're gonna to write that tie? Yep, that's God's. My wife taught me how to prioritize giving to God before I even knew Christ. We've got to prioritize prayer. Listen to me, church. If we won't prioritize prayer, we cannot expect anything to change in 2019. You know, they say the definition of insanity is keep on doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I'm just going to keep on doing this. I'm just going to keep on doing that and expect something to change. But nothing really ever changes. Why? With our prayer life. Because we must prioritize prayer. Secondly, we must simplify our prayer life. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever watch the news? Or do you ever go on a social media and you see all of this bad stuff happening around the world? You see human trafficking, un- unhealthy people. A, p- a friend of mine just posted on social media a couple days ago, diagnosed with cancer. You know, you see the sick people physically. You see sick people emotionally. You see sick relationships. Marriages are in trouble, heading for a divorce. All these kinds of problems. And, and I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when I, when I see all of that, I get overwhelmed. And I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what to pray for. It's like after your kids have been down in the basement playing, and you go down there, and you're like, what in the world happened? I didn't even know tornadoes hit this part of the world, you know? And they just, there's toys all over the place, and they go down, and you're like, clean up. And they just kind of look around, and God bless their souls. They don't even know where to start. It's so terrible. And you, you start pointing out things. Pick up that. Pick up this. Pick up that. We have to simplify our prayer life. When all these things are happening, we, we, we get overwhelmed. We don't even pray at all. But, but you know, we're not alone in that fact. When you, you get so overwhelmed and all these things are kind of bombarding and stacking up on us and we feel overwhelmed and stressed and all these kinds of things. The Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 uh, epistles in the New Testament, he, he experiences too. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, he says this. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So you say, Matt, what do you mean when you say simplify our our, our prayer life? In Luke chapter 6, verses 7 through 8, the Bible says this. It's not on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you. And when you pray... Do not babble on like pagans, for they think that by their many words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Have you ever been in a prayer meeting before around some other Christians and and somebody will start to pray and, man, they're busting out that King James language, you know? It's like, Father, art thou God in heaven, thy glorious kingdom come, thy will be done. We've come to you today, and you're just like, wow. And somebody will always say this, man, that dude really knows how to pray. (laughs) I always wonder, what does that even mean, he knows how to pray? Jesus is saying, you don't got to use all these fancy words. You don't just got to keep babbling on and on and on and on, thinking that the more you talk and the fancier language you use, that somehow that gets you access to the throne of grace. No, it's through the blood of Christ that gives you permission to enter into the Holy of Holies. When you get to talk to Jehovah God, it's not about how you speak, how well you speak. All throughout Scripture, we have example after example of men and women alike who are deficient in the way they communicate, but God still uses them. And so many times, I I just believe this, we need to simplify our prayer lives. We We need to go and get alone with God, and we need to tell him what's on our heart. Like Paul says in Romans 8, 26, we need to let the Holy Spirit guide and lead us, 
And we need to talk with our father because that's who he is. He's our father. When my kids come to talk to me, you know what they call me? Daddy. When my little girls, the boys are getting too old. The other day, Isaac and I was walking into Walmart and I grabbed his hand, you know, and I held his hand. And uh, he's like, what are you doing? Hold my hand. I'm like, well, buddy, I'm going to hold your hand. And then we were in the van, and we were sitting on the, in the front seat, and I grabbed his hand, and I held his hand and, and uh, for a little bit. He let me hold his hand for just a couple minutes. And I went home, and I told Mama, I said, hey, I said, it was so sweet. Isaac was sitting there. I said, it was so sweet. Isaac just reached over and held my hand on the way home today. And, and he's like, I didn't do that. You grabbed my hand, you know. And, 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 but, but, you know, since I've had children, I, I appreciate and understand the Father's heart so much better. Oh, man. Let me just free some of you up today. Because the reason why you don't pray is because you don't know the Father's character. The Bible says he loves you so much he sent his only son to die for you. Now, if that's not love, I don't know what is. A love unimaginable, a love unfathomable, a love that you and I cannot define. This is the Father's love for us, and we think that when we get before his throne, we got to talk a certain way for him to listen. He's given us access because of his grace. We must prioritize prayer. We must simplify our prayer. And the third point today is we must have faith-filled prayer. We must have faith-filled prayer. In order to get healthy, we have to acknowledge that there's a problem. We have a problem in the church today in 2018. The problem is this. I'm just going to say it. We don't really believe that our prayer life matters. We don't really believe that when I spend time with God, it's making any sort of difference in the lives of the people I'm praying for. It's not really making any kind of impact in my life. It's not really advancing the kingdom. We don't have faith. The psalmist says this in the 135th Psalm, verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deeps. And we camp out on the sovereignty of God. And then we just say, he's going to do what he's going to do. He wants to do what he wants to do. And so I love him. I'm for him. He's for me. I place in my faith in Christ. But my prayer doesn't really matter. Does that sound familiar to anybody today? We don't believe that prayer really matters. But did you know that there are more if-then clauses in Scripture associated with prayer than in any other single human activity? For example, the Lord says this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 through 15. This is a promise for his people, the Israelites. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. In other words, prayer makes a difference. Prayer really matters. Things really hang upon prayer. It's not just an activity you see to make yourself feel better, But what we see in Scripture is that there are dozens of passages in the Bible that explicitly state that God, listen to this, God changed his plans in response to prayer. The first time I read this and the first time I heard this taught, I I have to be honest with you, I kind of threw up a heresy flag. I was like, I don't know about that. I don't know if our prayer is really that powerful. But let me give you an example, just one, for time's sake this morning. In Exodus chapter 32, God announces his plan to destroy the Israelites and start over with Moses. He calls the Israelites stiff-necked people. But the Bible says this in verses 9 through 10 of Exodus 32. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Now, this is the creator of the universe talking to Moses. He says, I see them all. I see their pagan idol worship. 
I see them, like Malachi says, I see them bringing in their, their second best, their leftovers. He says, Moses, just leave me be because I'm about to pour out my wrath on these folks and I'm going to start all over. But Moses intercedes. Moses prays on behalf of the Israelites and apparently it makes a difference in the heart of God. Because look at what verse 14 says of Exodus 32. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And in verses 10 through 13, Moses is interceding. Moses is crying out. Moses is praying for God not to do what he desired to do. Now, now listen, don't get it twisted. God's going to do what he wants to do. But what we see in this one example is that prayer matters. Listen to me, friends. You've got somebody in your, in your family that needs salvation. What if you started praying for them like it mattered? You, you've got marriage problems. What if you began to pray for your marriage relationship like it actually mattered? You got work issues. You got financial issues. You got all kinds of problems, right? What if we began to approach prayer like it could actually make a difference? What would our 2019 look like? If we actually believed that our prayer mattered, we must have faith filled prayer. And then finally, this morning, we must be God dependent in our prayers. I preach or I listen to sermons like the one I'm preaching right now, and my temptation in the flesh is to walk out of here, pull up my bootstraps and do it. I'm going to pray every morning from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m., four hours. If the Puritans could do it, I can do it. You know, and, and, and we, we, the Quakers do it, I can do it. You know, the Amish are out there, you know, they don't even got any electricity. Like, we can do this, you know, and, and you just slap the cell phone out of your wife's hand. No, we're going to pray for five hours. Put that down, you know. Like, we, we try to muster up this strength. But here's the problem. The Bible says we don't have it. The Bible says we can't do it. That's the entire message of Christianity. You cannot get to God but through Christ. So if we cannot get to God but through Christ on the cross, then how can we have a powerful prayer life? It must begin with the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our lives. If we are not full of the power of the Holy Ghost, we are in deep, deep trouble. Listen, we are wasting our time. I don't care if you pray for 13 hours straight. If it's not spirit-filled and led, you are wasting your time because you are praying in the flesh. We must be God-dependent in our prayers. Romans chapter 7, verse 18 says this, And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. You, you say, well, man, I've heard these kinds of sermons before. I, I felt this kind of conviction before, and I say, well, I'm going to pray for this amount of time every day. I'm going to do this, but it, it, it just kind of fizzles out. It never really gets through. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we want to do what is right. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I believe? I believe the majority of society wants to do what is right. Now, there's a lot of people who don't want to do what is right. But we want to do what is right, but I can't. He doesn't say sometimes I fall or sometimes I, he says I can't. Is he saying there's no hope? No, he's saying there's hope, but it's through Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says this. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. No more power. And we are no longer slaves to sin. Praise God, hallelujah, amen. That's good news today. As we venture into a new year, we don't have to be slaves to sin. You say, Matt, why do you say that? As we close this morning, we have to make a confession today. I want to potentially change our thinking about this. Listen to what I'm about to say. Prayerlessness is sin. Did you hear what I said? Prayerlessness is sin. When we choose not to have a consistent, abiding, powerful prayer life, we are in sin. We are choosing not 
to petition the throne of grace. You say, well, why is it sin? Because God's told us to pray. God's told us to take all things to him. Andrew Murray is one of my favorite authors of all time. He was a pastor, and he's written all kinds of books. I think I own every one. I love them. He says this, and I quote, If conscious is to do its work and the contrite heart is to fill its misery, it is necessary that each individual should mention his sin by name. The confession must be severely personal. In a meeting of ministers, there's probably no single sin which each one of us ought to acknowledge with deeper shame. Guilty, verily guilty, than the sin of prayerlessness. Saba, Scott, uh, other pastors and leaders in the room. You, you, we get together and there's a meeting and we talk about this, that, and the other. But how much time is actually devoted to prayer? You know, I want to end today's service in a different way. I want us to actually spend time in prayer. And you may say, well, man, I'm really uncomfortable praying out loud. Take a deep breath. Nobody's going to put a microphone in your face. Nobody's going to ask you to pray out loud. You don't have to do that, okay? Everybody is journeying with Christ at their different stages today. But what I would like for us to do is with the people around us in just a moment, I want us to form a circle. And I have three prayer points up on the screen. And I want us to spend just a couple of minutes on each prayer point. Because I, I don't want us to leave here today. The Bible says that my house shall be called a house of prayer. Friends, I'm here to tell you, if God is going to do anything in 2019 at Fellowship Pickering and in the Fellowship's Church Planning Network, we better be about prayer. Prayer is powerful. And prayer matters. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite Odain to come up. And Aaron to come up. And what I want you to do right now, if you haven't already, introduce yourself if you're a member at Foster Pickering. But kind of turn your seats around and get into a little group, little circle, okay? And I'm going to lead us through a time of prayer.